In parts one and two of this mini-series, I tried to emphasize that this wave of UFO reports were common, and many of them fall in line with technologies that were explored and classified top secret 60 years ago or more. But we also took a quick look at historical UFO accounts from thousands of years ago, most likely not human technology. But what are they then? Let's break it down and analyze it in part three of this Genesis Week special report. Thanks again for joining me. I'm your host, Ian Juby, and thanks again for the overwhelming feedback I've received on the miniseries thus far. To be honest, after part two, I was wondering if my ADD had just gotten the better of me. But after hearing from so many viewers, it was very encouraging that the area of historical high tech was relevant and important to, to the overall topic of UFOs. Hopefully you can start to see why the answer to the question of what UFOs are is a complicated answer and it needs to be addressed on a case by case study. So ignoring encounters with alleged aliens and focusing only on UFOs and including all reports from across the board, the sightings investigated by MUFON, the military reports, all of your friends and family that have seen a UFO, what could they be? Well, they could be a number of things. Uh, right off the bat, even MUFON researchers will tell you probably 98% of the UFO reports are explainable. And by that, I mean an unidentified flying object could subsequently be identified through examination. For example, balloons are a common one. This is a UFO I filmed over Deep River, Ontario in 2020. It's a UFO! A number of UFO sightings turned out to be meteors. The Chelyabinsk meteor over Russia was dramatically captured by countless numbers of cameras and eyewitnesses before it exploded and damaged windows and buildings for many kilometers. But meteors during the night or day can become a UFO sighting. Uh, rockets are another one especially at dusk or dawn where it's still quite dark, but the exhaust plumes uh, from the rocket are lit up by the sun over the horizon. Satellites are another one, and especially with all of the SpaceX launches of the Starlink satellite trains, you get a very dramatic line of lights traveling at high speed across the sky. Uh, there's been a good chunk of UFO reports that turned out simply to be Starlink satellite trains. I've only gotten to see one satellite train myself, and I have to say it was far more impressive to see than I thought it would be. I can easily see why some would call it in as a UFO. Surprisingly, a very common misidentified light in the sky is the stars and planets, and Venus in particular. Now you may find this odd, but one needs to understand that the optical distortion caused by atmospheric conditions can make this possible. Uh, moving air of different temperatures can cause lensing and can cause stationary lights in the sky to appear to have movement, or it can greatly exaggerate the movement. Uh, think of it like uh, looking at lights through the edge of a glass lens. Uh, this is exactly the effect that cryptozoologist Herb Stein and I saw when we studied the mystery lights of Marfa, Texas. At night when the desert was still hot and the air was cooling down, it would create a dramatic lensing effect that greatly distorted lights from towers and cars on a highway as much as 20 miles away. And it took a lot of work to figure that out. And when we first got there, the lights were like nothing we had ever seen in our life. And those were just car headlights. So one could easily mistake those lights for UFOs. And the same distortions can happen to planets at certain times of the year and certain atmospheric conditions. So what else could the UFO sightings be? Well, they could be hoaxes, of course. There has been hoaxes and no doubt some of the unexplained UFO sightings are hoaxes. As I covered at great length in part two of the remaining unexplained flying objects, many can be super secret black tech. 
uh, originally many top secret aircraft were seen as UFOs during testing, development, and initial deployment in the US. Obviously, these could not be acknowledged publicly by the military. Now it's being revealed that there's been UFOs spotted over US military installations that were not US aircraft, and that since the 1950s. But I think you can see where I was going with at least some of these UFOs being revealed the past few months. I think they're just foreign military black tech, and some pretty serious black tech as well. Next on the list of possibilities is that these UFO sightings are craft from extraterrestrials. Now, I very briefly gave some of the reasons why that is very doubtful, and I'm about to overwhelm you with a pile of more reasons against that, but I think you would agree it's important to have that on the list. Lastly, the possibility arises that these UFOs are something darker and more sinister. Uh, interdimensional beings, or even as one unnamed Pentagon official said, demons. Obviously, I'll focus here on the last couple of items as I believe I've exhausted the others on the list. The 2004 Tic Tac incident hurls us headlong into confronting our knowledge of conventional physics. It's an uncomfortable place to be in, so we might as well get comfy. Because that incident was recorded on multiple radars, infrared cameras, multiple eyewitness accounts, hundreds of millions of dollars of US military hardware tracked this thing. You can't write it off as a misidentification or a hoax. So you have one of two options. Our knowledge of physics is either grossly in error, or we are grossly ignorant, or both. Or this was perhaps a supernatural entity. So take your pick. Regardless of what you want to believe in that regard, as I will shortly demonstrate, you believe in the supernatural, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. Now, there are very few laws of science and nature. A scientific law only becomes a law because the observations have been consistent, repeated numerous times, without failing, and with no contradictions. There are two scientific and natural laws which specifically address the idea that life could arise from natural processes, the law of biogenesis and the laws of thermodynamics, specifically the second law of thermodynamics. For brevity, I'll focus on the simpler of the two. The law of biogenesis came out of research conducted by Louis Pasteur in 1864. It was his experiments that led to the pasteurization process we know today. Basically, the law of biogenesis is that life only comes from life and that like begets like. We have never seen an exception to this scientific and natural law. So, any proposed process that produces life from non-life is neither natural nor scientific. It defies this well-established scientific and natural law. Such a process would be, by very definition, an extra-natural or supernatural process. A miracle! So congratulations! Whether you believe we were created or you believe we evolved, you believe in the supernatural. This should make the uncomfortable discussions of supernatural entities much easier for you. <laughs> Now, the whole concept of aliens is firmly rooted in the theory of evolution. Now, I'll be the first to admit, sci-fi would be dreadfully boring if it weren't for aliens and alien life on other planets. But, find me a sci-fi book, TV show, or movie that has aliens that does not operate on the presumption that these alien life evolved elsewhere in the universe. There are very good reasons why life only comes from life, and that the idea that life can arise from a rock sitting in a pond is only possible in the imagination. Let me give you a quick example of why that is, uh, pointed out to me by my good friend Stan Lutz many moons ago. <laughs> the cells in your body and brain are composed of, and even controlled by, proteins. 
Some proteins act as building blocks, others as enzymes, still others act as hormones. Uh, there's a whole whack of different proteins, and they are all different shapes, sizes, and structures. Proteins are built up from smaller components called amino acids, and there's about 20 of them, 20 different amino acids to choose from, and you can think of them something like Lego. You have 20 different Lego pieces to build with, and which pieces you use and how you assemble them radically changes the design and shape of the final construction. In fact, if you get one wrong piece or even the right piece put in the wrong way, you may not be able to complete your construction. But this variety of parts enables you to build very large, incredibly complex structures, and it's the same way with proteins. If you join two amino acids together, and you have 20 amino acids to choose from, how many different combinations can you make? Well, it's 20 times 20. 400 different combinations is calculated as 20 to the power of 2. 20 options and 2 in a sequence. So if you add a third amino acid to this construction, and it too could be any one of the 20 amino acid av acids available, then you have 20 to the power of 3, written out that's 20 times 20 times 20, or 8,000 different combinations to choose from. Add another amino acid to the construction and you have 20 to the power of 4, 160,000 different combinations. And by the way, during this construction, you need to get the correct combination all the way along. You need to add the correct piece out of a choice of 20 pieces and add it into the construction in the right sequence over and over again. Or else, like our Lego construction, you will be unable to successfully build the construction. You can quickly start to see where Sir Francis Crick, co-discoverer of the DNA double helix, gets his numbers in his book, Life Itself. Now, he used a smaller protein of only 200 amino acids long, as an example, and the number of combinations is simply written out as 20 to the power of 200. This equates to approximately 10 to the power of 260 different combinations. Written out, this is how many different combinations are available. Effectively, only one of those combinations is the correct one. To help you grasp the sheer astronomical size of that number, it has been estimated that the total number of atoms in the entire universe is around 10 to the power of 80. Yes, someone with apparently too much time on their hands actually sat down and figured that out. The universe is claimed by the naturalists to be around 13.8 billion years old, you know, give or take a week or two. Now, I don't believe that number, but let's go with it. 13.8 billion years times 365 days times 24 hours times 60 minutes times 60 seconds means the universe is 435 quintillion 196 trillion 800 billion seconds old. So you have that many seconds in which to try out all 10 to the power of 260 different combinations. Dividing 10 to the power of 260 different combinations by that many seconds means you need to mix and match this many different combinations of amino acids every second for 13.8 billion years. To be guaranteed you'll arrive at the single correct combination of amino acids to construct one protein. And that was a relatively short protein. Do you know how many proteins you ate for breakfast this morning? And let us remember the estimated number of atoms in the universe by putting that number here for reference. This isn't a simple formula of odds or chance. What I've shown here is what would be required of a process unguided by intelligence to produce one relatively short protein. This is not at all like the seemingly impossible odds of a major lottery. Now, the odds of winning the lottery can be exceedingly small, but someone somewhere will win in spite of the exceedingly small odds because there is a lottery set up with a prize and a method of drawing the winner. Our protein formed by chance doesn't even have a chance. The odds are not exceedingly small, they are literally zero. You cannot win this lottery for the simple reason 
that the lottery cannot be set up with a draw and a prize. It's physically impossible. There are literally not enough atoms in the universe with which to try the astronomical number of combinations you need for the chance forming of the correct combination for natural processes. There is no lottery. Therefore, there is no draw, no prize, and no winner. To top it all off, you'd need to repeat that process at least dozens of more times just to make enough proteins to make some basic components of a single cell, and not even a complete cell. And even then, you still do not have life. It is a literal, physical impossibility for life to arise from unguided processes. This is precisely why we have the law of biogenesis. The first life must have been assembled by a hyperintelligence who is outside of the natural realm, who is smarter than the sum of all our greatest minds using the greatest computers and artificial intelligence. In fact, pay close attention here to what I say. The sum of all our greatest minds using the greatest computers and artificial intelligence cannot bring a dead organism to life. So, to make claims like, hey, life evolved here, surely it evolved somewhere else, is not only a non sequitur, it is a nonsensical statement. The impossibility I just described is for the formation of one protein in our entire known universe. The odds against alien life are now infinity squared. So infinity times infinity, because you will need to accomplish the impossible, not just once, but twice within the same universe. No, life could not evolve from non-life here and therefore could not have also evolved elsewhere, because the laws of nature are the same everywhere in the universe. That is a major scientific reason why we can confidently deduce there is no intelligent alien life on other planets. I know, how boring. Thank you, Captain Killjoy. You just ruined sci-fi for everybody, Ian. Yeah, well. <laughs> now, some might say that here we are, looking at vehicles apparently defying natural laws, and those may even be the craft of the entities from outside our natural realm. Perhaps those entities, those extraterrestrials, were the ones that created life here, us, the human race. Well, that actually doesn't answer the question, where do we come from? It actually dodges the question. It only brings up the question, um, where did the aliens come from? In either case, you wind up boiling down to creation or evolution. Nevertheless, fair enough, let's consider the possibility we were created by aliens. After all, that is precisely the belief of many people, like the Rayelians out of Montreal. Now, I have to give the source for all of my materials, but I have to warn you before you go to visit this site that they have adult content all over the site, so viewer discretion is advised. But look at this, right on the splash page of their website. Extraterrestrials created all life on Earth. And in what has to be the ultimate irony, look at their logo. Intelligent design for atheists. For supposed atheists, they sure use that term intelligent design an awful lot, and they're mighty quick to talk about the prophets, as well as their own leader, Rael, being a prophet. But as you're about to see, these contradictions are consistent throughout the preachings of the proselytizers of the alien faiths. Notice there's an S on the end of faith, because there's a lot more than one of the alien faiths. And something you'll see consistently confusing and contradictory is references to Jesus. Usually, as a prophet and an alien. In this case, Jesus was just like the other prophets. Moses, Buddha, Muhammad, etc. Except there's a problem with this claim. A huge problem. Unlike all these other guys, Jesus claimed to be the creator. In fact, it's very interesting that a lot of these proselytizers of the alien faiths refer to Moses as one of the great prophets and Jesus ranks 
you know, right up there with Moses as a prophet. Yet, Jesus met with Moses and Elijah, another Old Testament prophet, during the Transfiguration. And Jesus said to the Pharisees in John 5.46, If you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. After Jesus called the disciple Philip to follow me, Philip went and found his brother Nathanael and told him about Jesus, saying, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. When challenging the Jews in dialogue, Jesus remarked that their father Abraham rejoiced to see his day. And the Jews pointed out how Jesus wasn't even 50 years old. How could father Abraham, dead for some 1800 years at that point, rejoice to see Jesus' day? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you before Abraham was, I am. The Jews then picked up stones to stone Jesus. Why? because they knew their Bible and they knew exactly what Jesus just said. When Moses met God in the form of a burning bush and God commissioned Moses to confront Pharaoh to release the Jews from bondage, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? God responded, Say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. When Jesus said to the Jews before Abraham was, I am, he literally just claimed to be God, the creator. And according to Jewish law, Jesus was to be stoned to death for making such a claim. Jesus claimed to be the creator in a human body that he created specifically to dwell in. He then demonstrated he was such by not only raising the dead, such as Lazarus, but Jesus raised his own body from the dead. Moses didn't. Muhammad didn't. Buddha didn't. You'll also please notice that that great I am created the stars and lights in the heavens in Genesis chapter 1, one of the books written by Moses. Now, would you not agree that there's a huge difference between an alien who dwells among the stars and the creator who created those stars? And that same book, Genesis, tells us why the stars were created. And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth And it was so. The stars weren't created to be a home for Zoltar the space alien. They were created for our benefit here on Earth. So surely if he was an alien, Jesus would have told us so. He did not. Instead, he specifically told us he was the creator and demonstrated his power. Now, you don't want to believe he's the creator? Well, fine. But don't go citing him as some prophet and authority while systematically ignoring everything Jesus said and did, including his claims as to who he was and the miracles he performed to prove he was who he said he was. He claimed to be the creator, not an alien. The irony is also thick and rich with this concept of an atheist version of intelligent design. All the atheists I know of would spit out their coffee reading atheist version of intelligent design. Atheists would contend intelligent design is simply a form of creationism. I would contend that intelligent design is actually a scientific tool that you and I, and yes, even atheists use every single day. If you're out wandering in the forest and you stumble across this abandoned car, you know that that car had a creator. It didn't form by unguided natural processes like geology, wind, and rain. Well, congratulations, you just used the scientific tool of intelligent design to deduce that that something had a creator. In like fashion, we can look at life, such as us, and examine things like the genetic code in our DNA. Code of any kind has an intelligent designer behind it. That's a fact. You don't see the Windows operating system 
suddenly appearing after a crash on what was a blank hard drive, well, you just use the scientific tool of intelligent design to deduce that. In like fashion, even atheists use the scientific tool of intelligent design every day, a scientific tool they despise and scoff at. Have you ever heard of the SETI project, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence? They are looking for signs of intelligence in radio signals from outer space. And if they received a radio signal from outer space that was coded in some way, <laughs> I would agree with them. That is powerful evidence of intelligence. But is it not hypocritical to say that code in a radio signal is powerful proof of intelligence, but the code in the DNA is not? Ironically, though the SETI program has been running for decades, listening intently, peering deep into space, searching for extraterrestrials, they have found no evidence of intelligence out there. None. Nothing. Not a shred. With respect, you're not seeing the forest because of the trees. Not only is the evidence for a hyper-intelligence all around you and even in you, your intelligence itself is proof of that hyper-intelligent being who created you. After all, are you going to contend that your intelligence was ultimately the result of a random explosion that happened in the universe billions of years ago? Intelligence only comes from intelligence. And the searching for extraterrestrial intelligence has turned up blank. Now, this is an important data point in assessing whether or not these UFOs are coming from off planet or not. We see no evidence that there is even is extraterrestrials out there to send UFOs to our planet. So in part four of this series, we'll put more of the UFO encounters and encounters with alleged aliens under the microscope to see if we can determine what exactly these things are. And I'll give you a big hint. Just listen to the message that these alleged aliens bring us. I hope you'll join me again. You can catch the entire series in a variety of ways. You can watch the show online at www.completecreation.org or www.genesisweek.com. You can also purchase the Complete Creation series in full high definition on Blu-ray or video on demand at completecreation.org. Or support the Miracle Channel with a monthly tax-deductible donation and access the entire Complete Creation series in high definition through Corco, Miracle Channel's video on demand service. We need your support to keep this program on the air. So please pray for us. And if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, K2K2P4. Or you can make a donation via PayPal online at ianjuby.org forward slash donations. And thank you for your support.